Games, Brains and Bang Alive here with another episode of The Nasties. And today we are doing uh, one of the most famous. Hmm. One of the most famous. I've heard of it before. The Driller Killer. Directed mm -hmm. by and starring Abel Ferraria. I don't know if I'm saying that quite Ferrara. right. Ferrara. Ferrara. Yeah, a yeah. pretty famous director. Um, King of New York. Bad Lieutenant is probably his most famous work. Oh, I've heard of it. Well, yeah, I mean, that's had mm. a remake as well. That that That's like incredibly popular. I think mm. it's something like nearly nearly 8.0 on IMDb out of wow. reviews. Like, it's, that's his, that's his uh, probably his most successful work, mm. but I would cite this as probably his most famous work. Yeah. Um, of course, a video nasty. Mm. So this is a funny one. It's because... The story kind of behind why this is a nasty is not like the others. Mm. Because this is basically a nasty because of the poster. Mm. The original artwork that you can see on the other side of this. We'll get into it when I do the yeah. special features. Um, so, basically it was released theatrically in America in 1979 without any controversy. Yeah, America, no problem. However, in the UK where our moral outrage was reaching fever yeah. pitch, we saw in a different way. However, Vipco, Vipco, which is the distributor mm. of Driller Killer, did not help matters with even something that I find absurdly stupid. Basically, they took out four page advertisements in movie magazines, video game magazines of the cover. The infamous cover, which is the drill head going yeah. into uh, the skull of one of his victims. Full body with a tagline, there are those who kill violently. These are magazines that are freely available to everyone. Oh, God, yeah, that, that's that's the, that's the point. I mean, because obviously, yeah, just in in general, like the artwork for films, there's different artwork for different where places are going to be put. So things like The Shining and stuff like that, it would just be just pictures like say for example the hotel. You wouldn't show like the bloody stuff that goes on because it's not happened. And like, even like trailers, that's about my point. Actually, was my, trying to make a bit better. The trailers, they have 12A trailers, they have like they have different trailers. Red different... They call them red band trailers in America, the ones that are adult and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, so they kind of, on purpose, they pick the content as... The yeah, you could, yeah, you could advertise the Driller Killer without the yeah. violent the imagery. The name alone is pretty much, ooh, the name says, what's on the tin? The Driller Killer. It's not about <laughs> a nice man. No, of course. And also, like, it's funny because um, obviously this is a much more conservative time. Mm. So it's not like... And nowadays, I don't think it would be such a problem. Not in, like, a video game magazine or probably in, like, Empire mm. or something like that. But in, like, a lower brow um, kind of Fangoria kind of style mm. thing, I think it works quite well. But obviously the advertisement resulted in a shit ton of mm. complaints. However, famously as well, a lot of the complainants had never actually seen the movie. Oh, they were yeah. basing it off the poster alone. Yeah. Because if you see the movie, you'd you'd get it in context. Yeah. And you would actually see that while it has violent moments, it's actually a story based, there is a point to all of it this. It's like sort of a rockumentary for most of it. Fair it There's quite a lot of that going on in there. And obviously the title as well doesn't help matters. The Driller Killer, as yeah. you already said, it's quite, tells you exactly what it is. Yeah, there's no... And it does sum up gratuitous. I hear the Driller Killer... And I had never seen this. I knew of it, but I had never seen it. Mm. Um, and I knew it was obviously I knew it was more than just a guy running around with a drill killing. But you hear the driller killer, and if you're not that well versed with horror and so on, you hear that, and you're naturally going to think, oh, it's just going to be uber violence drilling. Mm. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So obviously it was uh, lumped into the video nasties um, and was added to the list of banned films as of 1983, just a year after its release date in the UK. Mm. Uh, this is a fascinating one. According to Mike Bohr, the principal examiner at the BBFC, the British Board of Film Classification, the Driller Killer was almost single-handedly responsible for the Video Recordings Act 1984, which is the Video Nasties. Mm. Um, under which, another, uh, and obviously the Video Nasties were released banned in the UK with that law. Yeah. That law does still exist today, by the way. Mm. But obviously it's a lot looser yeah. than it was. Uh, according to Brad Stevens, or a biography of Abel, uh, the ban in the film was almost entirely due to the cover of the video, mm. uh, which completely makes sense. I wonder if, when they look at these films, if the ones that are based more in real life tend to get more of a, a hard rap. No, so no, no. We had this in regards to... Um, which was it which really didn't get cut too heavily? Was it House by the Cemetery? Or it might have been in relation to Brain Dead, which obviously isn't a nasty, mm. but it was seen... No, it was Brain Dead. Because uh, we were talking in the brain... Uh, so go check out 10 Things We Love and Hate about Brain Dead mm. to find out this information, but I'll add it here. It is in relation to the fact that Brain Dead is still unavailable 
in Germany. It's yeah. still a criminal yeah. uh, thing to have mm. own own a copy of that, an uncut copy of that. And it never got hit over here. Yeah. And the reason being was the BBFC saw it for what it was, slapstick gore. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a major element. But also we've talked a lot about this in other ones. Imagery is a major part, lingering, mm. the visual nature of it, close-up cameras. Abel does a lot of that in this. Yeah, bits of, bits of that film stood with me. Like yeah. some, of the, some of the killing, some some not, but the, the main ones, I'm like, oh, yeah, that goes on quite a, quite a substantial amount of time. And it does. There's a lot of builds, a lot of tension sometimes with him just zoom round, round and yeah, drill, and the, you know? And the, the, like, well, we'll get to it, but when he goes through the skull, yep. you know, like, the, like, the time it will take to get through a skull, the thick drill bit, is like the amount of time that you see the drill It going stays through? on it. It doesn't yeah. cut. It doesn't do anything yeah. like that. Uh, this movie was prosecuted. This was successfully mm. prosecuted. Uh, was eventually released with 54 seconds of pre cuts in 1999. Uh, and was released uncut as of 2002. Mm. So the times they have changed. Mm. Interestingly as well, if I wanted to. Not that we do in these videos. But if yeah. I wanted to, I could put this entire movie right now here. Really? And not get copyright claimed. Wow. It is in the public domain. Okay. Oh, don't get, do you get that much for films? Uh, the most famous movie. one is Night of the Living Dead. Um, that's where you see it on films. That's the famous films, one. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this uh, the full correct story, but I believe that's due to a, uh, an issue with regards to signature, signatures mm. on their documentation. Yeah. And Nosferatu. Basically, I think it's something... Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but it's something like 100 years. Um, like... Copyrights. Ah, uh, okay. Um, and while you can renew them in some way, a lot of the time they just fall in the public domain as, as people die, yeah. uh, as companies go under and so on, that kind of thing. So bit by bit by bit by bit, things yeah. fall into uh, public domain. Ooh. But this is one that went there very, very quickly. Um, so if I wanted to, like I said, not that I'm going to, no interest. It's not these films. We don't even add clips. Mm. Uh, we could just add the entire movie here. Oh, okay. And while I suspect someone on YouTube would try and copyright claim it, I'd be very easy. It'd be very easy defendable yeah. because it's a public domain movie. Oh, so say point to like make a horror film and have someone watching a horror film. You, you could, could have this you in, could the have in the background easily, oh, okay. no problem. Same, same as say why you often get in a lot of horror movies, Night of the Living Dead or Nosferatu mm. playing because mm. they're public domain movies. Mm. So of course we have the Blu-ray here. This is one of the double ones where it's the Blu-ray and the DVD combined mm. uh, for reasons. If you yeah. want it. <laughs> Comes with a bunch of director approved special edition content. We have brand new 4K restoration from the original camera negative of the never before seen pre-release version and a theatrical cut. We watched the pre-release yeah. version. Uh, high definition Blu-ray 1080p and standard definition DVD presentations in both 185.1 and 137.1 aspect ratios if that interests you. The original uncompressed mono PCM audio. <laughs> uh, could have done without that. Optional English subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing. Audio commentary by director and star Abel uh, Ferraria, moderated by Brad Stevens, who authored his uh, or biography and recorded exclusively, exclusively for this release. I did say to you afterwards, I would actually be interested to re listen, mm. re watch with Abel's commentary because he is the director and the star. I like his accent as well. I like New, I like New York accent. <laughs> uh, Lane and Abel, an interview with the Driller Killer, a brand new interview with, with Abel. Uh, Willing and Abel, Ferrari, lo, lo, Ferrari Logically, Logically 101, a new visual essay guide to the films <laughs> and career of Ferrari by Alexander Heller Nicholas, author of Cultography's Miss 45. Uh, Mulberry Street, Ferrari's feature length 2010 documentary portrait of the New York, New York location. That has played a key role in his life and work. Available on home video in the UK for the first time ever. Trailer and, as always, reversible sleeve featuring original newly commissioned artwork by the Twins of Evil. So that is actually the front cover we've been showing you already. Which is that cool ass shit. And then famously, there it is. Mm. The imagery. It's, it's very grubby as well, isn't it? A... The blood runs in rivers mm. and the drill keeps tearing through flesh and bone. Nice. Nice indeed. So, come on, kids, get watching. <laughs> yeah, come on, Johnny, smoke it up. I think, yeah. Yeah. So obviously, uh, we've kind of already suggested we both like this film. Yeah. We both enjoyed this film quite a bit. I was a bit worried when it first started. Mm -hmm. I was a bit kind of like, oh god, what is this going to be? Because the start is a bit. It's kind of like the rest of the film. When you watch the rest of the film, it all makes sense. But the beginning of the film. Just a bit like, oh god, it's gonna be one of them weirdy arty ones that I don't really enjoy, and the sounds as well. But when it gets going, I'm like, yeah, this is good fun. I'd watch it again, which is a good sign for these films. Some of them are like, I'd never watch that again in my life. 
True, true. And this one I watch again because it was just it's f- quite fun. I think watching it again as well, you might get a little bit more from it in regards mm. to the plot and be able to pay attention to what is sometimes pretty shitty sound yeah, quality. Yeah, I, I thought it was me at first. I'm like, no, no, no. And it is, it's quite mum, something quite mumble, mumbly. Mumbly, yeah. Mumbly, and then sometimes it's great. Like some people in the band, when the guy's gibbering away, I'm like, yeah, I can hear you very well. <laughs> But yeah, it is a it is a very good film. Mm. Um, I really liked it actually for its story more than anything mm. else. But it is got a, an opening that only at the end you kind of realise does kind of tie into it mm. a little bit. So we're introduced to Reno, who is Abel Ferraria. Um, he enters a church. Basically, the opening is him going into a church uh, where it's very odd. He's very you already think there's something wrong with him because his expression. He's a bit like oh, yeah, slack, slack jawed. Um, Yes, yeah, slack jawed, he's sweaty, his clothes are dirty. You kind of think, I actually thought we were coming in like at the end of the movie mm. and we were then going to go back in time. Yeah. But um, he approaches, there's a derelict elderly man, a homeless guy at the front muttering away. And Reno approaches him and then reaches over. Like He's reaching over to touch him and the man grabs his hand, which has Reno rush out basically mm. past uh, a nun and who is his girlfriend, Carol. Uh, Carol is played by Carolyn Mars. Mm. She's quite pretty. Um, yeah, I, I got. She, I thought she looked like Catherine Zeta Jones. Mm. Um, I got that from her I face like as well. Mm. Um, in the back of a taxi, you know, she kind of asks him about him, and the fact it turns out he received a note, uh, a letter to come and meet this person. Mm. A note. Uh, this person had his name and his phone number in it. Mm. This is basically his father. Yeah. His estranged father. Yeah. yeah. And Reno, he does well to kind of hide his frustrations and disappointment with what mm. just happened. But clearly, it bothers him. Mm. Uh, we, we, you can, you tie in a lot of the blank, blanks here yourself. Yeah. You, you fill in a lot of the blanks mm. that he obviously hasn't seen his father for a very long time. But also, he's ashamed of him. And as will be proven, he has it. It's kind of causes him an issue with the, the homeless and the the destitute people of this New York yeah, borough. He's got some sort of like weird fascination slash obviously what he goes, what he does in the end to, to these people. You know, mm. so mm, unresolved. Unresolved, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but Reno just kind of like he just makes that like it doesn't matter, it doesn't care, and so on. Mm. Um, you know, then then we get our first introduction to the band, uh, Roosters, mm. as Reno goes to a club, and they're like a punk band, a new wave punk yeah. band. I think new wave is the best way to call it. You got a little bit of mixture of that kind of snarl from the early days of punk, but with a lot of the Adam and the Ants yeah. uh, kind of theatrics. Yeah, what well, new romantics? He was yeah. like, new wave. Yeah, that was fun to watch. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, I like look at the club. Like I got the idea, I got the impression of it was just like, obviously we go to like grubby pubs. It felt like a grubby club. It did, but it's also on the cusp of the new era of rock music, so to speak. Mm. I had a lot of this throughout it, and it's one of the things I think the film portrayed brilliantly, which was the changing times of punk, mm. um, which is a more middle class interest. And the club isn't as seedy and dirty as you might expect. And it's more about dancing, less about moshing, that kind of thing. Yeah, and I th- let's say the guy, the, the actual band themselves, I mean, obviously they recorded, they recorded an album. Yeah. So they have money, to, they have a little bit of money, but it was just like, how, how do you have all that money? Like, are you, is it parents giving you a bit of money? That kind of thing. So, well, we'll like get said, into that, I yeah, think. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. But the like, nitty gritty about the band, because I wanted to talk about the first introduction to them. Yeah, yeah. Hated it. Hated it. It's because of the way it's recorded and the time they come across really jarring. Mm. Uh, it's filmed up quite and quite irritating. It was a bit like mm. oh oh, and then when you realise oh shit, you're going to feature a lot in this movie. Mm. I didn't really like it. However, by the end, mine completely changed. Yeah. I actually loved it. Yeah. Loved what it implied. Loved what it uh, in it, it, it does. Mm. You already talked about the main frontman of the band who actually <laughs> ends up becoming quite endearingly fun yeah. um, and cute to a certain degree. Mm. And you know, there's, there, he remind he reminds me. Of um, Heinrich a little bit from Possession. Oh yeah, yeah. Just, Do you see what that, I mean? In that, that kind okay, of character, I'm, um... I'm going to chew the scenery a little bit here, which is fun. Yeah, that's good. So we're kind of introduced then to like back. Then we go to the apartment the next day, and we see it's a bit run down. But we see Reno's artwork. He's an artist mm. and a pretty talented one, in my yeah. opinion. What I really liked as well was they made him a character who visually we could appreciate and go, oh, you know what? You've got talent. Yeah. You have got it here. And the fact that you can rent an apartment in New York, like yep. even back then, even back then, you still have to have a little bit of money. So obviously his, his paintings were good enough to kind of... He's been know. selling them. Yeah. And the story is he's working on a massive Commission. masterpiece, yeah. a literal full-size wall 
piece uh, starring a buffalo. <laughs> the buffalo's face killed me. It's a proper like shocked look on his face. Well, you look at his when we see his paintings a lot, and you realise mm. he has a lot of um, themes relating to his mm. painting. One of the things there's a constant theme of what looks like scars, almost scars, Te- like a te- tears, tears, almost. Yeah. But he also does great um, line work to the point where I think his work almost sometimes looks like three D. Mm. The film early on focuses a lot on the buffalo's eye, mm. and it looks Amazing, real. Yeah. It really, really does, which makes a later point in the film where. Abel gets hurt quite badly. Um, Reno gets hurt quite badly. Mm. I I felt for him. Yeah. I felt the pain because I was like, man, come on. Yeah. You know? But yeah, basically, money's an issue. Yeah. Struggling artist it is. He lives there with, we've already said, Carol, who uh, is a former flight attendant, and Pamela, mm. who's a younger girl and a, a, a drug addict, basically. Pamela is played by Baby Day. It's uh, a cool name. It's a cool name, yeah. Um... <laughs> And they're in Union Square. You see a lot of signs for Union Square. I don't know if you mm. noticed that as well. Yeah. Um, so basically, this is one of the early scenes where you kind of get an impression of how Abel was going to play Reno, mm. where he argues or has a go at the women over phone calls, electricity yeah. bills and stuff like that. And his dialogue, it's nonstop. Yeah. Like he'll, it's a rant, basically, with no pauses. Mm. But it not one focus. It goes one piece of dialogue about one point to yeah. another directly afterwards. Yeah. Um, and I quite I, I, at first I was like, oh, I'm not too sure I like that. Mm. But later I could to appreciate it again because I saw it as it's just a combination of thoughts, and he's just oh, I'm going off on one. I'm going yeah. off on one. And it seems like obviously the money kind of adds to the adds to the stress because you kind of, of get, get the idea that you should be a bit more fun and a bit more laid back about things. Mm-hmm. Obviously, with the money, he asks for an advance, doesn't he? On his he asks for an advance from the art gallery owner. Yep. For for extra for, for extra bill for his money for his bills he's up front he says look I need money to cover my bills yep. he's like, but art dealer's like no I've already given you uh, uh, advance um, yeah, yeah get, get on with it so he's like okay so obviously then obviously to the girls like I I need this money now cause a bit of friction with his girlfriend doesn't it saying she's like got to pay the rent well let's talk about these relationships then yeah. because it's never completely defined and you kind of have to work out a lot for yourself but basically mm-hmm. we summed it up as Reno and Carol are boyfriend and girlfriend yeah. However, Carol is bisexual, mm. so she also has a girlfriend, which is Pamela. Yeah. Um, I don't think Reno and Pamela have a relationship. No, I thought uh, at first it was a bit of a, like a thruple, like a, fr- a fruit, like a a, 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 tri- a trio, a trio. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, well, but I don't think they do. In fact, I think Reno sees Pamela almost like a child, a daughter. Mm. And this is summed up by a really wonderful scene where you kind of see a lot of Reno's kindness as well, because he's a really likable character. Mm. As when um, he wakes up to find. Uh, What's call it? Um, Pamela. Pamela. Sorry, I forget my yeah. name. It's Pamela. Mm. Trying to drill a hole in a door. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, no, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. And it's a good minute long scene mm. where she keeps changing her mind. Mm. But he never gets frustrated with her. Yeah, I He's always like, oh, you want it here? Okay. Oh, you want it here? Okay. Yeah. And I really liked it. Yeah, because like, quite clearly she's obviously maybe coming down from something or just on something. So she's not, she's not quite with it. Yeah. Um, obviously most of the movies she's not quite with it but yeah just the whole thing of like oh make your mind up but he never does that so it's just like okay yeah, he never just goes just... will you just make your mind up he just keeps going okay alright you want it here mm. and he goes to start no 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 she's like no no I'll change my mind he's like okay where do you want it now alright mm, yeah so it may have happened in the past the two and the three of them but it's never shown it's always just it focuses just on him and Carol and she's just lived there and it never really, it never shows a sexual side of Rena's behaviour, except mm. once in a club later on where Pamela's kissing his neck. Mm. Uh, the only sexual side we get is a scene between Pamela and Carol in the shower mm. together where they're kind of making out and you get some boobs. Yeah. Um, and they're often sleeping in bed naked. You can kind of see they're sleeping in bed naked yeah. together. But you never see Rena Parda. Often, he's lying at the bottom of the bed and his mm. clothes are on the floor. Yeah. You know? It's more like a com- it seems like more like a comfort thing, really. Like they just take a comfort each other more than like a, a real obvious sexual side to it. It's what I got from it. I agree with you on that. In mm. fact, we said that we we said it was we thought it was more of a free love, last bastions of hippie culture mm. thing more than anything I else. I noticed something as well. That even when that Pamela later on, she sleeps with someone else... She still comes back into bed with Carol. Yeah. So it's just, I think it's just a comfort thing for him. It's, so. uh, it, it's, it, it's, these are the last bastions of hippie mm. culture tied into a punk, uh, modern, p- punkish way of living and the decrepit world that is well, decrepit New York mm. and the collapse of industry and stuff like that yeah. during a period. It's all summed up quite prettily mm. through shots and just uh, not in your face. It's just, we often, you know, we'll see a lot of shots of the desolute and des- derelict outside mm. having drinks and stuff like that. Um, 
it works. Yeah, and I, I thought like people like so Pamela's character. I thought I wouldn't like. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, it's going to be a question quite hard to kind of get on with. But I, I quite liked her in the end. Yeah, I, I, I don't think amazingly. Mm. I don't think there's a bad character in this. No. I don't, even even ones with minor roles, the art gallery owner. Mm. It serves a purpose. Yeah. It, and you can believe characters like that exist, yeah. and they, they do. We've seen them in use movies. Their position of use their position of power. Yeah, abuse. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so on. But like, there's other certain scenes that kind of are very important. Uh, I think to the plot as well. There's one uh, during this period where um, Reno watches with binoculars. He's like watching the desolate des- uh, on the street, and he watches what looks like a drug deal mm. take place, very and wrong. someone gets stabbed in the back. Mm. And he kind of focuses on the fact that no one really does anything. Mm. Everyone just sort of stands back and watches which I think is a very important element of the time as well. Mm. Very similar to modern day life now where everyone, you know, something happens, people tend to just stand back because mm. they just don't want to be involved yeah, because being a hero can sometimes get you in trouble as well. Yeah. Um, and it's sad, of course, but it's very, very relevant to the fact that when he does go on his killing spree, how, and he's killing derelicts, how those bodies are just not, you know, oh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, you don't see any kind of follow there's, up after. Yeah, really. there's one story about one one guy in particular, but it's just a story in a newspaper. Yeah. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, important to the plot then. So he's trying to finish his masterpiece. The art gallery owner is not going to give him any money. He has a week to finish it. Do it in a week and I'll pay you for it. Yeah. That's the plan. Um, this is where we get a little bit more insight into Carol, who I suppose if there's one character who maybe isn't the best, it's her. Mm. Purely because we kind of get an insight into the fact that she's a recently divorced she's got alimony yeah. payments and she uses that to cover their rent even though they're still behind yeah uh, they're behind with rent but she covers it for another month that kind of thing and you get the impression as you said she's used to the finer things in life yeah. she's the most well she's very middle class yeah. she the way she dresses the way she keeps her hair mm. compare her to pamela it's very very different Obvious, yeah she, yeah of different backgrounds. And it early on makes you go, ah, oh, you're having a bit of a midlife crisis here. Mm. You know, is this what it is? Particularly she um, gets a letter from her husband later on who says he still loves her, her ex-husband and stuff like that. Mm. And you can see she's kind of like torn between the possibility of going back to comfort and an easy life or this fun, interesting, exciting, which is losing its luster because, because of the money. Yeah, money issues. Yeah. He's stressed. Snappy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the roosters. Basically... They move into this apartment block. Mm. They are going to be recording their new album <laughs> in this in, in one of the apartment blocks, um, which is funny in itself. Mm. And they play for a month, able to afford the rent up front, no problem. There's a, th- a three-piece band. We have a mm. guitarist and vocalist, a bass player and a drum, but they bring with them a bunch of girls, yep. uh, some who, play, who are backup singers, uh, some who are basically groupies hanging yeah. on, one who is the lead as you were. <laughs> Call her a manager if you want. Mm. Um, but basically, she's very protective yeah. of the band with girls and think coming in and stuff like that. It creates issues between her and Pamela. She's very jealous, isn't she? Yeah, she's kind of trying to protect her her um, her position, as it were, mm. as head groupie if you want. She has, I do like a uh, rant. When the when the lead singer brings in two new girls for backup singers, and the, I, I even commented, I thought, they look quite... Um, Quite well done, up, well composed, quite neat hair, quite neat makeup compared to the rest of the group, like the other girls. And she just goes on this rant to the lead singer, like, "Oh, I don't want these new girls in there, rubbish." She doesn't take a breath. It's quite impressive. She doesn't take a breath on the whole dot bit of dialogue. And, yeah. And I think it just looks like, "Oh wow, <laughs> this is what I've got to deal with." Um, but yeah, I really like that element of it. And um, you could say that maybe some of the scenes, some of the, I think there's maybe a bit too much of the the band being shown. Um, the good, I do like it, but sometimes you look it. I don't know, maybe just a little bit too much time overall. The film's time is dedicated to the band. I'd yeah, I think we do get a lot of shots, a lot mm. of time spent um, with them in the practice room, and pe- mm. you know, over and over again. But I think the point in the end is to because is to show a the passage of time, but also how much it's affecting Reno. Mm. It's basically they're playing all hours, which would yeah. be incredibly frustrating. Reno goes to complain to the uh, the superintendent. He don't care. Superintendent don't give a shit. He's got um, money. Uh, particularly as well that ties back in the original. He's kind of like, look, they're paying me rent. You ain't. Yeah. You know what I mean? And he's like, look, uh, and he, he give this is where he gives him a skinned rabbit that yeah. he was taking care of. It's a pretty gross scene. He gives him a skinned rabbit. Um, Reno takes his frustration out on his dead rabbit. Mm. It's quite graphic. Yeah. It's already dead and skinned, um, but he kind of just hammering the shit, stabbing the he- crap out of its skull, yeah. uh, which is much. Basically, although we do focus a lot on the roosters, um, the main focus is actually Tony, Tony Coca-Cola. 
yeah. uh, DA Metrov, uh, credited as Rodney Montreal. He's the lead singer. He's mm. the guitarist. He's our kind of uh, very laid back. Hey, mm. man, it's called oddity in yeah, the movie. Yeah. But he is wonderful. He is wonderful. Yeah. Uh, he really will kind of le- draw you in, mm. I think, as you watch it. Um, so a lot of, basically we got a lot of, not so much cutting, but a lot of passage of time situation. Mm. Really trying to work on his um, painting with a week. Mm. Um, shots of the band playing over and over again. He gets a bit frustrated at like, getting woken up at two in the morning while he's trying to work on a painting. Yeah. And he sort of shouts about it. Um, during that period, we see the explanation of how he's able to use the drill on the street. I lo- Before we started, I was like, it's the 80s. Those things won't... You were like, battery. I was like, no, not in, not in, not in what I thought was the 80s, but 79, yeah. even less. But he actually sees an advertisement on TV for like... Uh, Proto-Pack. Proto-Pack, which is uh, it's basically a battery there in your pocket with the wire that plugs into the back. It's an, it's just one of those forced in, yeah. this is how we can explain him able to use the drill on the street. The film's a good effort for it. Because he does a fair old, <laughs> he does fair a old fair old slog. chunk, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that battery's good. <laughs> um, same as the drill, you know, uh, the ability of that drill to do what it does. Mm. So basically, he goes and wanders the street and he runs into a bum. And it's like he sees this bum as his father, almost, mm. a father that he didn't have. And also his potential future. With no money coming in, he mm. could end up on the street. And it's just highlighted when he talks to like, his superintendent as well. He talks about all the stuff being out on the street and yeah. stuff like that. Um, there's kind of a weird thing where, like, they hide from a gang, kind of, again, just to just sort of show you the the world mm. they're living in, the, yeah. the city they're living in. But um, he kind of rants at this bum that uh, he's not going to end up like him and yeah. things like that. It's clear uh, that, he's, that, you know, he's very worried about, concerned about being that, being yeah. his father and things like that, yeah. being one of these winos on the straight. Uh, probably doesn't explain why he goes on a killing spray, but there you go. Yeah. Um, it's actually when he has a kind of a dream where he sees like an eyeless carol Mm. Um, that kind of really seems to affect him more than anything else. And basically, he goes out in the street with a drill. Mm. That's kind of what really happens. Um, yeah, he just kills people. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's quite a, just a frenzied attack, you'd say, really, wouldn't it? Well, the first one, not so much. He just kills one person. Yeah, just the, fir- the first time, yeah. Yeah, and then he kind of like, seems to forget about it. Mm. Um, and then... They basically go to a club. Him and the gun go to see the roosters mm. at a club. He's not up for it, as he puts it as well. Like, and I, you know, he's heard this music for a month. Basically, <laughs> yeah. you don't need to hear this music yeah. anymore. But he goes because the girls want to go. So there, you get like the toilet scene between Pamela and the head honcho of the the groupies, yeah, was, yeah. where she threatens Pamela. Pamela don't take no shit. Yeah. Pam, you can tell Pamela's trying to make her moves on Tony Coca Cola, yeah. um, but it's subtly done. You know, yeah. she dances a little bit in the front, that kind of thing. Um, and it's this night, really, that Reno goes on his killing spree, yeah. his mad killing spree. He kind of goes back and gets his drill and just goes out crazy. Like, yeah. he doesn't stop. Yeah. Whoever he runs into, bum-wise, homeless bums, he just kills. Um, yeah, there's mm. one incredible, incredible scene involved in this. It's a bit different, and it's at a bus stop. Oh, yeah. So you have an elderly mm. man and a younger man both waiting for the bus standing there. And there's a... A homeless guy comes along. A homeless guy, a deranged homeless guy who's kind of going a bit crazy. And it's quite, it, it's funny. It's actually funny. Because he pretends like the guy's his dad. Yeah, he pretends like the older guy's <laughs> dad. And he's all like, hey, bus driver, look after my dad and stuff uh, like that. Yeah. And it's really uncomfortable. And Will Bob is like, oh, please, bus, just come along and let these yeah. guys get out of here. Because I think living in London, you've always been in a situation where someone's a little bit, you don't know what way they might go talking to themselves at like a bus stop or a train station you don't know which way they're going to go so you're trying to tend to avoid contact full stop because you don't know if they're going to be a bit funny which is what this guy is you don't yeah. know if he kind of like flip to being a bit violent or just back off and go oh sorry guys yeah you know, absolutely so but he's just another victim for reno in the mm. end and through the back of the bus station yeah through the back of yeah. like the it, but yeah but through the back of the bus station through the back this is during this period is also where we get the infamous skull drilling Mm. Uh, scene which um make you know is probably the number one cut thing of the movie mm. it is up close it's quite violent mm. it's very bloody you get an idea of how it's slow it skull yeah because to go through someone's skull and the stuff that it wouldn't just be quick like sometimes in horror films they show someone stabbing someone with no pressure and you're like well, that's not really realistic because you couldn't you have to give force to do something like that <laughs> from experience um but the drill it goes in, like you see it going in oh yeah very nasty. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, after this sort of period, he's Greeno's kind of still working on his painting as well back home. Mm. And this is what Carol reads from a newspaper about a homeless guy being mm. killed with a drill. 
he seems to realise, like, not remember doing this, basically, because yeah. he kind of seems shocked, looks at the drill that's in the corner, seems to have, like, a flashback of his like, own behaviour, yeah. uh, does his nut at Carol, has a real go at her, like, real go at her, and this, again, causes the issues between what Carol's going to do eventually, yeah. even though he later tries to apologise. It's a pretty, pretty harsh rant, mm. unfortunately, um, kind of thing. It's one of the only times where he looks like a bad guy, yeah. in the sense, beyond the murdering and the killing and stuff like yeah. that. Um this he will eventually start to have more relationship with Tony. Yeah. Uh, Tony comes to visit and loves the painting. Loves the buffalo yeah. painting. He acts weird about it as he fucking does. Yeah. He's Tony Coca Cola after all. Um, but he wants Reno to paint him. Yeah. He wants to do a, a portrait. Artwork, yeah. yeah. Like I like what you're doing. Paint me. Um, really funny negotiation here. As uh, Reno's like, oh, I want five hundred. Yeah. Which will cover the rent. Uh, Tony's like, four twenty. Yeah. <laughs> And Reno's like, come on, you know, come on, you know, like, no, like that kind of thing. He's like, all right, $500. Yeah, that's, that's the end of that. Good, yeah. At the end of that. <laughs> and we get this wonderful section of the sequences where basically Tony is posing for Reno for the painting. Yeah. He will not shut up. Oh, God. <laughs> he yeah. will not shut up. And he's like, he constantly says, like, why won't you talk to me, man? Why yeah. won't you talk to me? And he's stuff trying, like that. Trying to work. Well, Reno never says a word. No. Reno never says a word. He just continues to work on the painting. And then, like, he cut a bit more and he's playing the guitar. Mm. Um, you know, I laughed and said to you, look, man, I don't mind playing the guitar, but no amp. Yeah. Get the amp out of it. Um, Pamela, yeah, another, point, another, another session where Pamela, Pamela starts dancing around. Yep. Yeah. While, he's, while he's being painted and then he's, um, Reno's still painting and them two are having sex on the other side of the room. Yeah, basically, Reno and, uh, sorry, uh, Tony, Tony and Pamela have sex mm. um, while Reno's finishing up the painting. Really good painting again. Mm. Really well done painting. Really, really kind of thing. You can be like, yeah, like that, that That's works cool. for the guy yeah. uh, kind of thing. And um, during that period, he basically finishes the buffalo painting as well. Mm. Because we then see him waking up Pamela and Carol to say he's finished the painting. Mm. And he invites over the art critic, uh, his art gallery owner, um, Dalton is his name, mm. to have a look at it. Now, we have to say this because it's important to the plot, but Dalton is... Um, Let's call it a homosexual. Yeah. Dalton is gay. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's obvious earlier on. He he has camp behaviour, but it doesn't mean mm, anything. It's like, there's a few things he says on the phone at the very beginning. Makes like he sounds like he's kind of um, maybe meeting a man for a bit more than just a business meeting. Okay. I think right at the beginning he's like, oh, oh the phone call when right Reno's was there. Okay, fair dues. I didn't notice that then. I didn't pay that attention. That it's more obvious later on, as you'll understand mm. why. Um, but it is it's important to the plot to bring that up mm. because of how. The situation will evolve. Yep. Uh, so Dalton comes over and is a dick about the painting. Yeah. He hates it. He thinks it's terrible. I think the worst thing he says is when he's leaving the apartment. Because Reno and Carol are just sitting there. Like, Reno looks broken. Yeah. Broken. Yeah. Carol looks disappointed. Mm. Um, but Dalton says something like, it's something along the lines of, man, like, how has it come to this? It's such a great artist has fallen into yeah. his lows. Hated it. Yeah. I felt so. I felt for Reno because I really liked the painting, mm. and I'm not an art critic. I don't know what's good or bad. I don't. Mm. I liked it though. But it it it's so harsh. It's so cruel, yeah. and you can see the pain. Great acting by Abe. You can just see what his last hope ebbed away. Yeah. Uh, Carol is furious. You know she chases off the door and screaming at him. That kind of thing. Um, but that's the final straw for her. Yeah. She decides to leave um, Reno and go back to her ex-husband. Uh, this is too much for Reno. He wakes up just as she's leaving, yeah. discovers that she's uh, packed up and stuff, chases after her. They kind of argue in the street, but she leaves in a train anyway. Mm. Um, he's pretty heartbroken over this. Yeah, and Pamela is as well, because you get a cut back to... like Pamela the, crying, yeah. Uh, yeah, really upset. Because again, I think that relates back to the whole comfort thing. Because I think she was really close to having Carol there. So that's quite nice they showed that. It's the it's the mm. it's the one part where you're like oh, I don't really care for Pamela uh, Carol anymore mm. because it's clear well look when the going's got what going got tough mm, she just, you went running yeah you know you, you wanted an easy life and suddenly you know no money that kind of thing yeah. washed up artist you're just like you're happy enough not even just to abandon Reno you're banning Pamela well. yeah. so your midlife crisis is over you're going back to your husband yeah. now yeah. Um, that she's the one negative character I suppose on that side it doesn't make me dislike her because she's well acted yeah. um, she's um, an important to the plot because again it's this element that pushes Reno over the edge to kind of go too far really yeah and she still supports she, she obviously like supports him and wants to you know she obviously cared about yeah. him you know she pays the rent she tries to support him and you know um, even when things are rough and that sort of the anger at that 
the um, art critic. Yeah. It was obviously frustration for him as well, like, you know. I hope so. I hope it was that. Like, we read it as that, and I hope it wasn't just because they're not going to get paid. But yeah. it's hard to know. Yeah. Um, so she goes back to her husband, leaving Reno. You get a lot of sort of, like, weepy moments with mm. him and stuff like that. And we don't really see Pamela much in this up until the finale, really. Mm. But basically, this has pushed Reno over the edge. Now, I said goes too far as if killing a load of homeless people because he probably killed a good six to eight people yeah. on the street. Yeah. But what he hasn't killed is someone that the police will actually be interested in, mm. which he will do. So he calls up Dalton and invites him over to check on something. Mm. Dalton's like, look, I'm not going to come over for that and so on. So Reno changes tact and implies... That it's for a trist, a trist. Yeah. Uh, for basically for a sexual encounter. Yeah. yeah. The way he kind of words it, he's like, it's middle of the Dalton's like, it's the middle of the night. He's like, oh, come over, bring a bottle of wine. And, yep. You know, he's all kind of like low spoken, and it clearly is for that. Not it's exactly that. that. Yeah. It's exactly that. I do like this as well because the only focus on Reno are here, and it's his face, and he's very blank. Mm. Pr- pretty much up until the end. Now, he, his expression is completely blank. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't have much passion in his eyes. The fire's gone out, basically. Yeah. The fire that was Ember's before is now just dull. dull. Yeah. Um, and I think that's very, very cool. Again, well done by Abel Varia for such a great role. Yeah. Um, so Dalton arrives looking sleazy, if we're honest. Mm. His shirt's undone a bit. He's got a neckerchief on. He's got a bottle of wine. Uh, it's all like, Reno. Yeah. As he comes in the apartment. Yeah. Um, he comes in the apartment, can't find Reno. Basically, he ends up dead. Obviously, yeah. he ends up dead. Reno attacks him with the drill. We don't see it from... We see Reno sort of rushing him and, like, the pained face. Mm. We then actually cut back to Pamela. She's coming um, home. What's to call it? Yeah, Pamela's coming back, from, I'm guessing, from, like, uh, audition... From, um... Oh, we see her, we see her with, the, with the roosters. Yeah, I'm with the roosters. She's just coming back from there, from them. Yeah, she comes upstairs and sees, like, the drill bit through mm. the wall. Yeah. Um, through the wall, through the door, should I say, mm. and blood coming out the other side. Uh, she opens the door and sees Dalton's dead yeah. body, kind of stuck in the door. So he's up quite quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what's call it? Um, and she goes to run off, but uh, Reno grabs her from behind. Mm. That's it. Yeah. We don't know what happens to Pamela. Yeah. We don't know if he kills her. It's hard to know. Mm. It's. Uh, I don't necessarily think he may have done. Mm. I don't just based on the character scare her away. I don't know. or may have knocked her out that kind of thing yeah. because um, the end of the movie brings us to Carol uh, with her husband Stephen mm. who's um, in a, an apartment across town basically yeah. she goes to take a shower Stephen makes them some tea um, it implies you know something's coming yeah. because it's very tension built as Stephen's making the tea mm. and each point you're like oh now it's going to happen now it's going to happen now it's going to happen it waits it waits it waits and then um out of off, off screen, Reno rushes in and stabs him in the back with the drill. Yeah, killing I, I killing th- Stephen. I thought it reminded me of obviously not a horror film like this, but um, Beetlejuice, the bit where the guy is making the tea in the kitchen. There's no music in the background. It's just the guy. I can't remember his name. It's quite a famous actor, the dad of the family, Deets. Mr. Deets. Okay, he's making the tea, and you just focus on him making the tea, and then the big. Um, Sculpture comes through the window and smashes him. It reminded me of that oh, so much. Oh, the early, early scene. Okay, fair yeah, enough. Okay. Like, literally just watching him make tea. There's no other music going on. Okay, just a focus on a really old task and he just rushes in. Okay. What does it remind me of? That was good. It was good because it was quite tense, like you said. Okay, cool. Mm. Um, yeah, so like he ends up dead. Reno hides the body behind the counter. So when Carol comes back in after a shower, uh, she thinks Stephen's already gone to bed. Mm. She then goes to bed um, as well. Uh, the implication is she's about to sleep with him because mm. she's all like being teasing and stuff like that. Yeah. She, t- <laughs> she turns off the lights oh, and blackout. it is a blackout. <laughs> I mean, we the uh, we can't see anything. Yeah. You, you will think your TV switched off if yeah. it wasn't for the, the tw- brief mm. dialogue. <laughs> as we see her kind of st- saying, Stephen, Stephen. Yeah. Um, it's it, it's Reno under the covers because yeah. basically Reno's under the covers. We know that much because um, he, he he responds only in mumbles, like yeah. murmurs, like, like you know, yeah, that kind of thing. And um, she says like the last line is for her telling him to come here, yeah. like come here, and that's it. Yeah, the Same credits just thing. roll. Yeah. We don't know what happens, but you well, we do know what happens. Yeah. Um, um, she's well, yeah. yeah she's got to be dead. Yeah, and he wouldn't last long after that. No, no, so. no. Uh, if if not suicide, um, yeah, he's killed too many obvious people yeah. there. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, obvious people. It sounds so bad. Yeah, to say no, it. but people. But like, it is a simple fact. Yeah, it's quite sad to say. Another good thing about the film was how they portrayed that because it just looks 
grubby. Yep. And if you didn't have an idea about New York crime at that time before you watched the film, you'd get an idea of just this area of how rough it is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's uh, The Driller Killer. Mm. Um, a very, very good film. Mm. I think I hope we sold it as best as possible. We have obviously, as always, skipped over certain um, sequences and scenes that are quite important. For once, uh, for once mm. we've kind of glossed over the gory side of the the the, the violence because it, it's so acute the violence like it's literally there's all there's the there's the rehearsal scenes there's all, uh, there's the club scenes and then it's just him going rah to start with the drill so it's the switch is very quick aside from the rampage through the streets mm. um the, the rampage through the street i would argue that it's very much a here's 15 minutes of story characters and elements that mm. are fun Here's a minute of violence. Mm. Here's 15 more minutes of that stuff. Yeah. Which doesn't sound like it should work, but it really does because this is a film with great characters, a good story, a very good story, mm. a great location. Shit, like I said, that when you start off, you're like, I don't think I'm going to like this. Mm. From, the, say, the rooster's constant practice to Tony Coca Cola yeah. to Pamela to suddenly by the end going, man, I really, really bought into this. Mm. You bought into it and end up really liking pretty much everyone. Yeah, I like the fact as well that when um, Abel, when he plays, when he plays that, when Reno goes off on his spree, there's no kind of over-the-top maniacal laughter or nope. just craziness, if that's the right word. But it's just what he's doing. He's just like, he's so intensely killing people. He's a psycho mm. with the, 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 with, that's understandable. In that, the, mm. the, the, the world's, his life's problems have become too much so he has snapped. And add that to in what is clearly a, a, a hatred for derelicts based mm. off potentially his own what fears that he might become one mm. and his daddy issues. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that combine to make him that. Mm. It, it, it works. Yeah. It works. And I think that makes him, it sounds weird because he is a murderer openly and a violent murderer as well. That makes him more, he's likeable. Yeah. I like him. I liked him and I wanted the best for him. I, I, I said it during it. I cannot tell you how much I felt for the part where his arc gets torn apart. Yeah. I felt so fucking bad for him. Mm. I really did, which says a lot. Um, you're not supposed to like your killers, but. Yeah, it was, a, it was a weird kind of film in that sense. I felt sorry for him. Mm. I think if he was a really hammy over the top one, you'd be like, Ugh, no, he's enjoying this too much. But never, there was never kind of any enjoyment from it, which was another point. Abel Ferrara does an amazing job of slack jaw, slack jawed uh, disconnection. Mm. That face, mouth slightly open, mm. eyes gone far yeah. away. It's wonderful. Mm. And what I really, really loved is that a lot of these elements don't come from the things you expect. We never see him doing drugs. No. Ever. I don't even think we see him having a... No, we do see him drinking half a can of Budweiser out of the fridge. Oh. But we don't see drink. We don't see no. drugs. These aren't the elements no. that are important. Mm. These aren't what they're implying, which I really liked. Mm. Um, even with Pamela, we never really see her doing drugs. No. It's it, more implied. Just from her behaviour. Like, yeah. She's, she's not quite... Well, she's all constantly... Looks like she's constantly stoned yeah. out of it. Yeah. And I say that like, when she finds a body, she that's when it kind of like proper sobers up and you kind of get a proper reaction from her. Yeah. Um... It does sort of show how much how many how much gore we've watched in these films that we're more disgusted by a pizza than they eat at one point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, oh, it was like someone sat on it and then served it to him, and we was like, "That is disgusting!" Outraged at this disgusting pizza that they were like, "Well, he was inhaling." <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I I really enjoyed it, and it's it's so good to have one that's not a complete drag to watch. <coughs> I really enjoyed this one. Absolutely, yeah. so did I. Interesting, interesting thing. Um, in 2007, it was announced that the film would actually be remade by Andrew Jones, filmmaker Andrew Jones, and it was reported that this new version of the film would also feature many unusual cameos and original musical score. The remake, remake would have moved the setting from New York to London. Makes sense, great. And starred David Hess, a uh, good actor. Um, he also contacted Baby Day to help co-produce and have a small acting role in the remake. It was going to be called Driller Killer Redux, uh, but came to a halt after a financial deal between the executive producers and the two people who held the rights to the original movie could not be reached. As of 2020, an independent filmmaker, Matt Jassielli, released a remake of the film entitled Detroit Driller Killer. Ooh, we'll have okay. to try and hunt that one down yeah, then. Yeah, independent filmmaker, that might be quite uh, Could gritty. have the same grittiness. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes when you've got low budget, you do make things gritty because of the lack of... But the interesting loss. thing is, I think, if you're going to try and do gritty, that, the point of why this is gritty is because it was the, the lo- time. It was the time, yeah. the location, the time period, the changing world. We talked a lot during it about like the changing face. It's mm. so hard... 
it's so, so silly, but you can't help but focus on the musical scene as well. Mm. And as music fans, as fans of things like punk and rock and mm. stuff like that, it creates this other extra element where you are seeing, and I said, I said it during the club scene, mm. where we get um, one of the later club scenes where the Roosters are playing, and they look at the crowd, mm. and they're well-dressed, middle-class women. There's no there's no punk outfits here. There's no spiky haircuts. Yeah. There's no leather. There's it's no... It's in-between part, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the changing face of punk. Mm. It's not the snarly spitting, mm. fuck you, I yeah. won't do what you tell me, punk, to, yeah. oh, okay, we, we, we fill up with we bad, we want a bit of drugs, a bit of drink, drunk and stuff like that, but at the end of the night, we want to go home to our comfortable beds yeah. and, uh, you know, suburban households. Yeah. That's what I kind of got from it, which I think was excellent. Mm. I think another thing about the grittiness as well, like, you can't, when you try and create that, you can't, can't create just it. Think, like, looking at things like Candyman, that, they actually filmed out in a rough estate. And you got the idea of that from the film. You so. can't, you can't fake that. No. You can't fake that. It'll be noticeable, and it is noticeable in many, many films. Mm. But there you go, Drill Killer, one of the best. Thank you very much for watching. You can check us out on gbhbell.com as well as on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Tumblr. Go to Patreon to help us out over there. That's patreon.com forward slash gbhbl, as well as Big Cartel, where you can find some of our merchandise. We have a podcast running on SoundCloud and Apple Podcasts. And of course, if you like this video, do us a favour, hit the subscribe button and help the channel grow. Games, horror and heavy metal, what else is life for?